Shalom and welcome to the Straw Hat. My name is Rabbi Neet Lea Sarna. I'm here with Rabbi David Wolkenfeld. We are the official podcast of Anshe Shalom B'nai Israel Congregation, an Orthodox community in the beautiful Lakeview neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois. In today's episode, we are going to have a three-part discussion. First, we'll just catch up. We've both been on vacation. Uh, the last two episodes we actually recorded a really long time ago, um, and we haven't been together in Shlensky Studios in a while, so we'll be talking about our vacations. Then we're going to do a segment about the Eruv, and lastly, we'll finish up with a segment about Tisha B'Av, and our interview this week is with an incoming a rising junior at Ida Crown named Ezra Ladman Fagelson, a regular at our Minyanim and a huge uh, personality around our show. So we'll get to know him. Uh, we'll get to know him a little bit as well over the course of this episode. So welcome back from Israel. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, how was? It was really, really great. And welcome back from Israel. How was? Thank you. It was fabulous. Um, so highlights? A uh, number of highlights, many highlights. Highlights included um, seeing lots of friends and colleagues and teachers who live in Israel or who were visiting Israel um, the same time I was there. Highlights include being able to bring my children to meet some relatives of mine and some places that are really special to me and to help um, pass on my love for Israel and being in Israel to my children. Uh, and a highlight is just any time you're away from the routines of uh, of the weekly work schedule to be able Can't to... Can't wait to get away from us, right? <laughs> it's not about getting away from anyone. It's about being able to uh, be present for my children at dinner and bedtime uh, and when and breakfast, um, you know, which is not something that I'm really around for, for when, when we're uh, back in Chicago. So I feel special to be able to do that. Yeah, of course. I was just kidding. <laughs> what about you? What are highlights for your for your time? Um, definitely for me, uh, family and friends in Israel are huge. Um, I have uh, some cousins that I feel really close to there, but also my 98 year old great aunt is like, she's the eighth wonder of the world. Um, she lives in Kibbutz Lavi. She lived this like amazing life. She and her husband ran a home for orphaned kinder transplant children in London before they moved to Israel and then they founded a kibbutz. And she's such a hilarious like storyteller and keeper of family lore and her short-term memory is a little bit gone but she remembers everything in the 95 years kind of <laughs> previous to that so she doesn't really know like that I'm married or you know some of the stuff uh -huh. that's happened sort of more recently but like it doesn't matter because that's not like the reason to go the reason to go is to kind of learn about my grandparents and my great-grandparents and what life was like in London it was so amazing when um there's a, a show on Netflix called Call the Midwife which is based on a, a journal of a midwife um, in London and like around the time and like oh, the wow. poor areas of London and around the time that my grandparents um, were alive and um, I kind of like watched that show and was like and there's a, there's a, there's a Jewish um, there's like a Jewish woman who gives birth in the show and I'm like that could have been my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, there's always like those windows into what that mm -hmm. what that life was like for them I always I always love and, and also she was very close to my grandmother and their sisters and um, and and I always go up to the kibbutz and kind of wonder like this is so different from my life. Mm -hmm. Could I be happy here? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really like it's still like a real kibbutz. They're still like you yeah, know no yeah. one makes their own money kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm yeah. always like, wow, they don't have to worry about money. Also, they can't like walk into a store and buy whatever they want. Like, hmm. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. And 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 you really kind of kind of just see see a totally different world, which is like really really interesting. Anyways, that's always a highlight, but it's also good to come back. And, you know, you take time away, you come back, you appreciate the things about your life here that are really good. And and for me, honestly, like coming back at, uh, and starting my second year, uh, Shabbat on the Lake was my first second thing. Ah, okay. and, and to walk into something and know what to expect yes. is very exciting. Yes, can you do many, many more seconds? I mean, there yes, there will be. Uh, please, God. Um, even in the coming days. Um yeah, so anyways, it's great to be back. I'm glad you're back too. Thank you, thank you. On Sunday morning of this week, we had a Bike the Eruv event. Um, I did not participate in that, but I did check the Eruv with uh, Ann Levinson on Thursday of last week, so I decided, you know, once around the Eruv <laughs> per week is enough for me. <laughs> but how was it? It was a lot of fun. The weather was really great for uh, for bike riding. Um, 
I, I now have, I think this is the, my first extended bike trip since uh, we had a Bike the Air event five years ago. So uh, oh, this is like a significant a uh, percentage of my bike riding at this point in my life. But mm. uh, it was really, I, I love bike riding and it was really great to be uh, on the bike. And I love our Arev. I, I'm really um, excited about it. It's uh, been something that I've focused a lot of time and energy on in the s- six years that I've uh, that I've that I've been here, and uh, it's a tr- really a treasure of our community that I'm really excited to and get enthusiastic about sharing information with. So, I, I, from my perspective, you know, the bike the air was not a checking the air event. We did not um, meticulously check every lechi and every wire to make sure everything was in its proper place. But uh, I think any chance to introduce more people to the Erev and its root and how it's comprised and some of the halachic principles that underlie it, I think makes the Erev stronger. Uh, the more eyes, you know, mm-hmm. you know, and on the ground that are noticing things and letting us know when things change, uh, the, the better, more robustly we can uh, maintain the Erev. And, yeah, Anne actually you know, told me a story this week that one time the Erev team got a call from some guy who lives in like West Rogers Park, who was just like driving on the drive and was like, "I think you have a lucky down yes, over yes, there." Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We actually get a lot of calls from people driving on the drive. That that's it's it's um it's if anyone's listening, it's very nice when they call. It, it seems that particular um, trouble spot doesn't is not an issue. Uh, it uh, the, the wire over the years has uh, bent away from being directly above the utility pole that it was that it's connected to, which is a problem. But we oh, install we have, a we have lechi lechi in the bottom, which uh, halakhically um, has the same purpose. So if you're zooming by at 50 or 60 miles an hour, and like you might not notice the lucky there. And so yeah. every so often we do get calls from concerned uh, neighbors to the north, but... Uh, which is very nice. Which is very, very nice, yes. Um, I want to... We've been throwing around this word lechi, so we should probably explain what that is. Um, but before that, I just wanted to point out that you have some really... Pra- you came into this job with some very practical <laughs> ear of experience, and people should know that you are responsible for the Princeton Arab. One of the people responsible for the Princeton Arab. When I was looking at colleges, Princeton didn't have an Arab, and that was a big turnoff. Uh, not being able to carry stuff on Shabbat is not great. Um, and so, I don't know, you should take pride in your handiwork. I could say, when we told that, when we, I went into a meeting with university administrators, and I gave them a list of uh, a series of top-tier universities that had all installed Arab in within the last 10 years, and Princeton was not on that list, and they said, we need to be on that list. And uh, that was a very important <laughs> Uh, step in getting the university support for uh, designing and constructing an Arab in Princeton. But I, so I, I, I made the first draft of a design that was left to uh, others in a few years later to actually complete it. But it exists now. And Rabbi Jackter, who trained me in how to, uh, everything I know about Arivin and how to design them and how they, they function, uh, we brought him to Chicago and to, he really um, helped us uh, upgrade the quality of our Erev in a significant way and help train now several iterations of Erev inspectors and repairers. And uh, and he's coming. And he's coming. So he comes every year to inspect the Erev. This year, we were able to get him for a Shabbat as well. So he'll come uh, for Shabbat as a scholar in residence and speak a little bit about the Erev, but about many of the other uh, areas of Jewish thought and halakha, which he has expertise. And then on Sunday, we're going to do the annual inspection of the Erev with him. Okay, so we were throwing around some jargon before. Um, so let's talk about what are the core elements of an Eruv. Um, and let's also talk about some things that aren't just the, the wall part of an Eruv. We've been talking, we've been learning about these a little bit in the morning. We talked about, uh, we, we did a few days of a Dvar Halacha about um, if you're on a cruise ship, mm. can you carry from your room into public areas and from public right. areas into your room? And on a cruise ship, you have all the physical elements of an Eruv in terms of the enclosed space, right? It's not a barge, you have guardrails. So that's actually actually not the question so but there's other elements to an error so maybe you can talk about that too uh, sure so you need a perimeter and you need I guess a melding of um, domains within the perimeter so yeah. in the, on, on the cruise ship I imagine you know because I, I missed those mornings but when you were teaching but I imagine it's uh, um, the fact that the owner of the boat has furniture in all the rooms or shared furniture that people eat their meals in, in uh, communal dining halls and so that it's not like you have you not rent you don't have a lease on your I mean I've never, I've never been in a cruise I don't know I don't think you have it's not like you have a lease on your little cruise And if housekeeping room. is coming in and whatever. Right. So so it's really one domain with, with bedrooms that you get to live in. It's not, not like an apartment building uh, on the water, right? So um, so it's really one domain that emerged. The way we accomplish that in a municipal area is by renting from the city or from some government agency the right to carry within the perimeter. So And then the other important element is shared food, and that's Sh- part of what merges it. So everyone who listens to our podcast should know 
There's a box of matzah in your office. Correct. And it belongs to you, dear yes. listeners. Yes. Um, and that is a core element of the Eruv. <laughs> Should you ever get hungry for a snack on Shabbos you or, can, or, week, or any yeah. day, yes. Um, but if you finish, if you if you see yourself Don't, taking the yeah. last piece of matzah, you need to tell us because otherwise the Eruv will be down yes. the following yes. week. <laughs> Yes, so there, I, I, I have um, in the past been known to snack on the air when I've been very hungry. Uh, but there as is, you should, as that's I, what it's there that's for. That's what it's there for, right. Uh, but it, it, is, it is not empty. The boxes are full of matzah, and that is that also, right? That shared food represents the core uh, of the... That, because the way domains are merged, because we're Jews, <laughs> is through food. <laughs> right, if I can come into your apartment to, to have some food of mine that is in your apartment, then, of course, you could come into my apartment as well. And really, we've then merged these two, uh, what would, were separate domains, are now merged through the mechanism of this shared food, this food in common. So we have the food in common is the matzah boxes in my office. The sharing of the domain is enforced because not everyone who lives inside the boundary of Erev is Jewish or aware or participating in our Erev. And so that's why we rent from the city the right to carry. And then the perimeter is comprised of the boundaries that we that we found, like the seawall and the metra track embarkment and fencing. and. I said, is it an embankment or an embankment? Oh, it was an embankment or an embankment. It's I'm probably sure it's an, an embankment. It's probably an embankment. <laughs> yes, I think an embankment is what trees do. <laughs> uh, Anyways, okay, yes. So the metro tracks embankment. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and, and and the, the and then and that that so that's basically the western perimeter of the Arav, and the eastern perimeter is basically the seawall, and the northern and southern perimeters of the Arav along Irving Park in the north and Fullerton and Diversity in the south is comprised of archways. Uh, an archway, like a gateway, is a way you could have a wall. You could have, imagine, like a series of archways. That's That could be a wall, right? And, and halakhically, we imagine that wall to be filled in um, with just that archway. So an archway has two vertical components and a horizontal component that goes across it. That's just like uh, utility poles, right? Which are the vertical parts with the wires between them are like your horizontal parts. So that's that's great, except the horizontal part has to be directly above the vertical part, which sometimes they build utility poles like that, like that, and sometimes we string up our own air of wire and we do it like that with a bracket that keeps the wire directly above the the pole. Uh, but if the wires are on the side, we can uh, retroactively make that into a wire that is directly above the vertical component by putting a lechi, a a little um, vertical component. It's like a vertical component. Yeah, a a lechi is a vertical component. A vertical component, right? Um, it ha- if it's 38 inches, 10 hands breadth tall, we halakhically extend it up to the sky. And so a 38 inch uh, little pole from the ground that goes directly below the horizontal wire is, is a way that we can complete our archway. And we use U-guards, little plastic, big plastic um, U-shaped things, and mm-hmm. we attach them to utility poles where necessary, and they are directly underneath the horizontal wire. In that way, we have our complete archways. It's easier to explain this, actually, when I can draw pictures. It's a little hard to do uh, mm-hmm. o- over the podcast. I guess you can follow up with me, and I'll draw a picture. Or better yet, we'll go out you <laughs> yeah, know, to the streets, and I'll together. show you. I'll show you. Yeah. So I have a question about um, the eastern boundary of our Eruv. Um, you, call it, you say it's the seawall. Um, so some people imagine that if you go to like an island, let's say, you, the island is its own era of it's secluded, it's whatever, it's owned by one person. Like, um, I asked this question actually to Rabbi Jackter one time, and um, it's important to know that it's actually the fact that it's a seawall yes. that makes it a boundary. <clears throat> it's not just land meeting water, and it, there's no beaches um, along our seawall, and if there were, that would be a problem. So I know sometimes in Lakeview, you're like, why is the beach so far away, actually, from where we mm-hmm. are? But our Eruv appreciates how far away the beaches are. Yeah, so it just be, and, and just to be explicit, because it has to be a certain steepness. A beach is a very um, gentle slope. That's why it's a beach. And a, an era of perimeter has to be steep. That's why it's a perimeter. It's like a fence. It's a wall. Mm-hmm. Um, and a gentle slope doesn't meet that definition. There is one beach uh, in our stretch of the Erev, and that is the Doggy Beach. Oh, yeah, the Doggy yeah. Beach. The Doggy Beach, however, is enclosed in a fence, and so... The fence becomes so the So the Arab. fence becomes the air perimeter for that little stretch of the Doggy Beach. That is true. So if you ever notice, like, the Doggy Beach fence is down, that would be a problem, because mm-hmm. the beach would be a breach in the Erev, were it not <laughs> for the fence. Um, and the other piece that uh, that comprises our Erev are sometimes the facades of buildings, um, particularly when those buildings are connected by fences. So then uh, we either won't have wires or the wires will just be there as a redundancy because it's ideal, like the ideal Erev is a city surrounded by a wall. Right. You know, like a real 
physical wall. That's like the dream Eruv. Um, so if you live in the old city of Jerusalem, good for you. Um, otherwise, most Eruvin are built like ours, but in places where we can kind of point to a wall and say, this is our um, Eruv, then, or a fence even, like the fence around the golf course. Correct. Uh, yeah, the, adva- the, the advantage of using those types of structures over wires are that they're a little bit more permanent. Uh, and, uh, and and less less fragile wires can be taken down in storms. Uh, construction can interfere with wires. Also, trees grow and they can divert it's wires. Can't see, can see them, or they could even just bend them at, mm-hmm. in a way that that is problematic luckily. And so, uh, when the Erev was designed, a lot of wires were put up, and we incorporated a lot of wires into the original design of the Erev. But in our subsequent annual you know inspections with Rabbi Jack, we've noticed that a lot of those wires are placed in, in locations where they're redundant because. They're lining streets that have are flush with building facades, and those building facades are, you know, are, are perfectly uh, fine area boundary. They're built facades mm-hmm. of buildings, they're walls, and uh, that's actually a benefit of the city over suburbs. Yes, in a suburban neighborhood, you have like you houses, have you know, single family yeah. homes with yards around them. That's not going to work here um, on on uh, Ashland and on. Fullerton and on diversity, there are stretches where just building flush to building with maybe a tiny little gap, usually with a fence in between. So it's really, it's really fine. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those buildings are, you know, they take a building down or they do construction, but usually they put a construction fence over the property line of a building if they take it down for some reason. So that, that's yeah. I would say construction works. is like the number one enemy of the A-Roof. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, thankfully, though, the A-Roof is written into the the official schematics of our neighborhood. And so you, they're supposed to call us if they if any construction project uh, along the area boundary interferes with an air wire. Uh, we're supposed to get a phone call, and, and that happens frequently, and we are able to uh, meet with a construction team and figure out a way for the air to stay up. They'll move a wire across the street. They'll put it from one pole to the next so that the air stays up even as construction goes on. And that takes an incredible amount of time and effort, and we love that our show has people who kind of can speak to construction companies and know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, so until now, we've been uh, utilizing the expertise of Seth Greenberg. Um, fortunately, he just moved to New York. So we're looking for new people who <laughs> understand what construction people say when they speak. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, like having somebody with an engineering background or architecture construction background is really helpful. Um, also, just having more people who can join the AREF team doing weekly inspections, that's really great. I think the, the bigger the team, then the less of a burden it is for any individual to go out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd like to have it done on Thursday uh, so that if there is something that needs fixing. There's time before Shabbat to fix it. So um, if you're able to go before work on Thursday morning or after work on Thursday afternoon, uh, or maybe early on a Friday morning. Lunch break. Uh, lunch break on a Thursday. If you work in the neighborhood, that would be fine. You know, if, if you have that availability, like that's let us know. And uh, we'd love to get you trained and join the team. The other fun fact about our Eruv is that we mentioned we use building facades. We incorporate a church facade <laughs> into our Eruv. <laughs> Very strange little factoid. I'm sure we're not the only one. I'm sure we're not the only one. Uh, I guess it is worth worth pointing out because we use these facades of building. It means that if the facade of the building is the air perimeter, that means that if you walk out the front door of such a building, you're outside the air of, right? So the air of map that we share um, is, you know, you can't assume that any sidewalk on those perimeter streets is included in the air of. The air of perimeter might actually be the... Uh, the facade of those buildings. So I guess you should you should check you have in. Have a question, right? Yeah. Call us. We're familiar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We also we have a more detailed map. We have the um, like the Google. Uh, the There's more, a Google map with like, like very, point by point. Yeah. So we, where the air of is. So yes. if, you, if you have occasion to walk mm-hmm. at, along those air boundaries, you should let us know. If you know, and don't do it without checking in because the air perimeter might be the building facade itself. In which case, none of the sidewalks are included, and the various stretches that is the case. Yes. So Tish Abav is right around the corner. The nine days are going to start on Friday on Rosh Chodesh Av. Um, Tish Abav this year is actually on Shabbat, so it gets pushed off to Sunday, um, which has positive and negatives. Um, the positives are that, you know, the shul can offer this really robust day of programming. Um, almost all of that programming is really geared towards adults. So we're going to talk about What's going to be happening at Shul? What even happens, you know, in the world, like in Jewish liturgy um, on Tisha B'Av, and uh, particularly during the daytime? And then, um, and we'll also kind of talk about what it might be like to have your kids at home on Tisha B'Av and to be trying to kind of keep them occupied and entertained uh, while you, while observing Tisha B'Av. Great. So maybe you could just say something about Tisha B'Av night, which is a pretty big night here at the Shul, and... Uh dramatic moment in the Jewish calendar. So share something about that. Sure. So at night, um, there's this actually kind of amazing moment. So Bemote Shabbat, 
Um, you normally make havdalah, but you make havdalah with wine and spices and fire. And the only one of those that we actually do on Tisha B'Av at night is um, the fire one, which I always think is just this incredible drama of we're making a blessing to God for creating fire, mm. which is what was used to burn down Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. And so to say, you know, the outset of our celebration of Tisha B'Av, thank you, God, for creating fire, I think is just this really um, complicated moment of recognition that, like, God created forces in the world that have been used to perpetrate incredible terror against the Jewish people, um, which is kind of the, the focus of the day. Um, so then we transition from there into uh, to that Mariv, and in the kind of at the towards the end of Mariv, we read Echa. Um, which we can say a couple words about, and then we also say some keynote, one of which specifically you only say when Tisha B'Av is observed on Saturday night, uh, which is a very beautiful uh, kinan. Well, and so let's also talk about what so keynote are. The first, first <laughs> what's Echa? Echa is the biblical book of Lamentations, so it's uh, f- a few chapters long. It's not five. five chapters long, not the longest, not the shortest. Um, maybe it is the shortest, but it's... No. Uh, Ruth is four. Ruth is four, so it's the second shortest. Um Second shortest of the Megillot, uh, we, it's, it's, uh, we, the custom is, you know, read from the floor, so it's not, not like a Haftorah or from any of the other Megillot where the reader is standing in the middle of the shul, you know, loud and proud and, and sort of his voice filling the room. It's, it's recited seated uh, from corners of the shul and uh, as we all are sitting on the floor listening in, in half darkness. So it's a very dramatic uh, moment, a lot of um, And it's a staging. very beautiful, unique um, trope. And the third parak has a different tune. And I once heard from someone who knows what they're talking about that that tune appears in enough different communities that they think they can trace it back to the expulsion from Spain. Oh, wow. Which is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a long time for a yeah. melody. For a melody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, neat. So, uh, and, and, and after Echa, after Lamentations, we read a few keynote. A kina is a, elegy. an elegy. So it's a m- mournful poem. Mourn, yeah, mournful, mournful liturgical poem, poem. and uh, these were mostly composed in the early Middle Ages, some in later centuries, and uh, we, so we recite a few uh, Tisha B'Av night, and then Tisha B'Av morning, following Shach, we, we read many more. There are dozens that have been written uh, through the ages. The custom at Anshay Shalem for, you know, time immemorial has been to read just a selection uh, of, of keynote in the morning, uh, but it's a selection that... Um, you know, picks some of the like I don't know, some of the highlights, some of the best, or or, or, or keynote that also are address some of the core themes of the day. So the destruction of the first temple, and the destruction of the second temple, and the uh, destruction of the Jewish people, and during these um, these 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 wars and and uh, devastations. Worth, yeah. I was just going to say it's worth noting that. Um we only say a selection, but for most of Jewish history, people only had a selection. Like this idea that we have yeah. collected keynote from all these different places. Like keynote were the the keynote books were community by community until you kind of had a greater ability to share them around and spread mm. them. That's why you have they're called like the collected keynote it, by yeah, yeah. you know whoever it is who collected them. Um, so it's you know like I don't think you need to feel like oh we skip so much or something <laughs> like that. Like that's I don't think there's really a, a tradition of saying all of the keynote book that's, that's, i don't think that's really a, no, that's interesting that's a, a thing. That's, a, that's a fair point that's a fair point <laughs> although i wonder when before they were international maybe each community could have had several dozen i, I don't know how many uh, right i don't know how many was like the norm but yeah yeah so so we and we take our time and each one is introduced uh with some some words of introduction and context and then we recite it at a not very fast pace, uh, but uh, everyone's welcome to stay and recite at even slower pace and to recite even more and to spend the entire day uh, reciting keynote. I mean, that's uh, also something that's a, and it's both an ancient old tradition to spend the entire day reciting these keynote. It's also a uh, kind of modern uh, tradition of Salavetia kind of renewed of teaching the keynote and using them as um, a launch pad to really delve into uh, so many other themes of Jewish mourning and Jewish history and themes of the day and um, and he did that, and to this day, many of his students uh, do mm-hmm. that. And, and you can find uh, places where that's, um, you know, live streams of the internet, various um, uh, Torah scholars teaching the keynote, at, or as they're reciting them with lots of elaboration and commentary. And this is a way that one could definitely spend the entire day. 
I mean, and another kind of keynote-related activity is, what are the keynote, right? They're looking at Icha, which is telling the story of the destruction of the first temple, um, and, and saying, like, what is my, what, where have I witnessed the destruction of the first mm-hmm. temple? Like, how, what in Jewish history going on today um, picks up on that theme? And then often they use the language from the book of Icha and incorporate it into telling a story about something they're seeing in their own time. So whether that is, you know, the burning of the Talmud, or whether that is the first crusade or whether that is the holocaust um or the expulsion from spain or uh the rindfleisch massacres you know like you really can learn a lot about the persecution of the jewish people Mm -hmm. um, just by making your way through the keynote but what's actually happening there is that you're seeing every generation of you're seeing every generation of jews looking into icha and seeing their own experience as reflected through um that that moment of destruction and and feeling that destruction personalized into their own lives Um, and so i think it's a moment for us to say like it's a moment to really um own the anti-semitism in the world and say like like it, it like Eicha opens up this question of god if you love us so much and if we're your chosen people like what is happening how could it be how could mm-hmm. this have happened to us um and it, it really like affirms that question for one day a year um and so to be able to look at the anti-semitism that's rife in our world today and 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 tie it back into this like core kind of visual of destruction that that comes out in Eicha, um, I think has been, you know, the practice throughout time, which is what was done in the creation of these keynote, but but kind of opens up the door for us to do that in, in our own times as well. That that, that opens the door to a lot of very fraught questions. I, I think it's, uh, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, Yushalmi's book, uh, Zachor. I think it's sure. a little more complex. I think there is a um, uh, definitely... A strong trend, let's say the Tishbev trend, to say that every tragic element of Jewish history is really a reiteration of this very same story, which is uh, our sins led to our exile, and and that is the story of Jewish history, and that is the tragic story of Jewish history, and every tragic event gets folded back into that one story, and and there is no other story that mm-hmm. needs to be told. And I think it's uh, there have been moments in Jewish history where we've broken out of that story, where we felt. Now, this is actually different. This this doesn't fit into that paradigm. This mm-hmm. is the suffering is too unexpected. It's 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 too severe. The scale of destruction is too vast that we uh, are not going to include it in Tishbev. We're not only going to include mm-hmm. it in Tishbev. So mm-hmm. I, I so think, that's uh, the conversation around the Holocaust, for example. For, uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. And the other direction, right? Like that. There's a lot of conversation this year after Pittsburgh. You know, is this the same as all anti-Semitism ever, or is it actually different mm-hmm. because the government came to our support and like that did not happen? You know, in the Rindfleisch massacres, let's say, for example, um, and that and that actually like separates this. You know, like is this moment continuous or not with um, with with that narrative? And but it's at least the day that opens that up for conversation and, sure, it, sure. and it's 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 a day where we're supposed to cultivate within ourselves kind of these um anxiety filled questions about it yeah and we don't have to answer them the same way each day of the year i think mm-hmm. it's okay to feel one way on tisha B'Av and feel a different way on saying yizkur on yom kippur and a different way on pasach and and to kind of think about jewish history and the triumphant and the tragic aspect of Jewish history in different ways, uh, according to the Jewish calendar. For sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's happening here on Tisha B'Av uh, during the day after keynote in the morning. So in the a- early afternoon, we are going to be showing a filmed um, lecture by Rabbi Alex Israel, who's a very uh, kind of well-regarded Tanakh educator and, and Torah teacher uh, in Israel. This is go- This is a Lecture that was re- will be recorded a few days before Tisha B'Av at the big uh, Tanakh uh, conference that Yishvar Hetzion and uh, Herzog College run. Have you I, ever been? By the way, I've never been. It's I, amazing. I, I really, yeah, I, 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 never, I, I went to the the smaller ones in New York that Chavvei uh, Torah runs every spring. It's not quite the same scale. Uh, not even close to the same scale. <laughs> yeah. Some of the same teachers, not the same scale. I'd love to go one year. That would be uh, an incredible experience. So it's it's a uh, hundreds of people uh, for several day, a week long or half a week long conference in Tanakh with some of the best Tanakh teachers in the world, lecturing, um, right, from morning yeah. till night. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I read about. Okay. That's what it is. And, okay. it's, and the energy is, like, amazing. And everyone's there with their, like, dog-eared Tanakhs, <laughs> like, flipping together. It's very fun. So Rabbi Israel is teaching at uh, a, rel- a Tisha rel- related um, themed class at this conference. In it's English. In English. It'll be recorded. And then we are going to, through the magic of technology, broadcast it um, in the early afternoon uh, in the shul, following 
that shiur, we are going to show a film, and the filmmaker actually lives in Chicago, and she's going to uh, be present as well and speak a little bit about her film. And following the showing of the film, we have a live uh, shiur. Uh, <laughs> Professor David Scheivitz of Northwestern is speaking about some of that history of the First Crusades, which was a horrific devastation of, uh, of a number of really pious and important uh, Jewish communities in the, in the Rhine Valley. And he'll be speaking about that history and how that history has shaped the further um, observance of Tisha B'Av. Uh, and, then, and then Mincha. Mincha and Tisha B'Av is already, uh, uh, you know, the end, the end is in sight. You know, it's like mm-hmm. his final bend. Uh, uh, we, we should mention, yeah, by the way, mm-hmm. that um, so the time, the first time at which you can say Mincha is a turning point in the day. Correct. So if until that time you've been sitting on the floor, that's when you can move already up to sitting in chairs. Um, I have, I have a wide diversity of relatives in Israel and I have some that every year on Tisha B'Av would bring food with them to the Kotel for Mincha because Mashiach is coming now and when he comes we'll be able to break our fast. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the, the, there's a move kind of already out of the, the morning practices of Tisha B'Av and, that's just, right. and, and the ethos, right? The night is very despairing and there's really no comfort in any of the very little mm-hmm. comfort and the, most of the keynote there's very little um, very little word, very few words of comfort that that, that whole feeling is really absent in the liturgy on the Tisha B'Av day, but, and, and uh, uh, tefillin aren't worn during Shachrit on Tisha B'Av because that's tefillin are kind of uh, like they're a, beautiful. They're right? splendorous and, yeah. and so, right, and, but at Mincha already um, tefillin are worn so it, it's it's already kind of things are turning towards uh, nor- normality somewhat and and, uh, and then uh, after Mincha we'll have a, you know, wait until until the end of the fast and we We'll have the ability to end the fast here. We'll have some chocolate milk and some bagels and stuff. So if you stick around for Mara, if you could break your fast here, but you could also um, go, home. go home and break your fast there. Yeah, that also works. <laughs> um, and the other thing we should just mention is um, because Tisha B'Av is pushed off, um, sometimes we might, you know, if, if it's hard for you to fast, we might say, you know, Tisha B'Av is a really big fast day. Um, but this year would be, you know, if, if in the past you've kind of persevered through, this year might be another year to check in um, with with you um, because the Shabbat is pushed off. Or like for a some of like a medical needed. condition, we're fasting, yeah. yes, challenging. So it's maybe somewhat less uh, strict for as it's pushed off, but... Uh, um it might be a year to like reopen the conversation at least. Yeah. 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 We also wanted to mention something about, you know, if you have kids at home on Tisha B'Av. Yeah. So it's a real, it's a challenge to fast with and, and have young children uh, around the house. Um, it's also a challenge to educate kids to see the significance in something as abstract as the tragic elements of Jewish history. Um, hopefully that's not something they've experienced firsthand in a direct way. Uh, and young kids are really not capable of understanding the, that kind of historical consciousness in most instances, if they can, maybe because you show them a sad movie, uh, but not not for like stretches and stretches of hours over the course of, of a long day. Um, so there's kind of a concept at play, right? Like in chinuch Yeah. So so this this is a phrase in the Gemara. We don't educate towards morning. Uh, Rav Nachman Ravinovich says that this means that when it comes to morning. For a relative, we do educate kids to do that because that is part of the normal course of affairs. We we hope that uh, one day our, our children and grandchildren will mourn for us, and that and so we do educate our children to uh, to observe mourning when, when God forbid a relative uh, dies. But the mourning for the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash, we hope that they'll grow up into a world with a rebuilt Beit Hamikdash, and there'll be no need to mourn on all of these days. These will be holidays, not not days of fasting and mourning, and so uh, we don't go out of our way to like you know, educate our kids to be really sad at this time of the year, and 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 to and to feel that that morning in the way that adults do. By the time they become adults, they you know they can't you can't just say surprise. <laughs> I don't think that you know like re- big reveal at someone's bar mitzvah. You know, guess what? There's a fast There's day. A fast day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so there has to be some preparation and education uh, for a life of mitzvah, including the the sadder parts of life of mitzvah. But I think that um, uh, you know parents should should feel. Um, so to just not not feel hard on themselves if the only way they can survive the last few hours of the fast if their kids are watching cartoons i think like don't worry about the kids like you can you know you're entitled to you know you can fast and the kids will be okay mm-hmm. uh, they'll figure it out there are um interesting educational um you know again depending on the maturity and age of a child there are 
you know, age-appropriate ways to educate kids towards Jewish history and the sad parts of Jewish history mm-hmm. and what Tishrev is about and the destruction of Beit HaMikdash. There, that all exists. Those resources do exist. Um, and, uh, you know, people should avail themselves of those resources as, as is appropriate for their family. But uh, I think it's also okay uh, just to listen. It's now, you know, it's four in the afternoon. The fast is going to end several more hours from now. Like, what am I going to do with my kids? Like, they can, you know, they can watch cartoons or they can go in the playground and you can just sit, you know, and, and, in, the and in the shade. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, have an easy fast, everyone. We have with us uh, for our uh, interviewee uh, today, Ezra Lamin Fagelson, uh, a uh, native Chicagoan. So uh, thank you for coming into our studio. Uh, this is great. So uh, how old are you? Where do you go to school? We don't normally ask our guests how old they are, but kind of to give people a sense of who you are and why it's exciting that we have you in with us. Currently, I'm 16. I turn 17 in a few weeks. Oh, exciting. Yeah. yeah I go to school at Ida Crown in Skokie. And how long have you been a member of the Shalom? Uh, I think I've been coming to Tasha Shalom since I, I was eight days old. So. <laughs> wow. Very, very big debut. Uh, I don't think they gave out drafts back then. <laughs> we can give you a, a remedial draft if you want. Oh, that, that would be... I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, so what's, what, tell us like, what your favorite um, time of year at the Shul. What, 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 what do you love about living in this community? Uh, my, my favorite time of year in Shul is the Chagim, Pir Ali, Simchas Torah, and... I love people just during Hakafo that are just so happy and dancing outside with the Torah and just it's a fun event. It's yeah. a very fun event. That is a, that's a good answer. That's a, a great, great time of year uh, for the community. And on uh, a regular kind of Shabbat morning, if someone wanted, were like, wow, I heard about Ezra on the podcast. I really want to meet him. Where would they, where would they find you? I can be found at the Hashkama Minion downstairs in Shlensky um, during the main service. Uh, I'm doing groups starting at 10:30. So, which group do you work with? I currently work with Narenu. How, how old are that? Yeah. They're in fourth and fifth grade. Do you like it? Yeah, they're good kids. They yeah, are they're, they're very good kids, good kids and, and they appreciate uh, the, the work that you do uh, with them. It's, it's a really important uh, task. So that's a very long shul day, Kashkama Minion, and then, and then you go off to, to lead groups. It's, uh... And then usually, right, you're back later in the day. <laughs> Yeah, then I'm back from Mincha, Mincha Marev. And... That's great. It's yeah. just one of our like minion stalwarts, I guess, when the school year allowed. When the school year is not in session, when you're able to be here, I would really appreciate that. So, um, And Ezra, you have like a, you have a, a certain kind of Chicago expertise. I feel like whenever I need to know how to get somewhere, you're sort of my, my go-to person. Do you want to you wanna say something about that? Sure. So if you ask my mother, she'll tell you that I learned to read from the street signs. <laughs> yeah. And... Yeah, just start from a young age. It's like two or three. I could tell you how to get from anywhere in Chicago just because I've been using Google Maps and so. I so okay, so today, I, I, today we're recording this on a Sunday in this warm weather on Sundays. There's a farmers market in Wicker Park where I like to buy vegetables and fruit. So how, how would you recommend uh, getting from the shul to Wicker Park on a Sunday? A Sunday, so you just go down Belmont, take that over to Damon, and. Just take Damon until you hit North Avenue, and then you're in the middle of Wicker Park. Very good. Very good. That is true. <laughs> well done. Well done. You passed. <laughs> where else? Uh, I know you, you bike to school sometimes. What's what's that route like? So that route, that's it's a little bit longer. Yes. It's about, <laughs> wow, really? it's about it's just under eight and a half miles. People think I'm crazy up there for doing that, but I enjoy it. I'm going to do it as long as I can. And wh- uh, what's, how do you go? What's the route? Usually I take Clark up to Lawrence. And from Lawrence, you can get on a path up by the river. Oh, you nice. just follow the river all the way up. And you hit the sculpture path, and you take, I take that all the way up to Oakton. And how long does it take you? It takes me around 40, 45 minutes. It's not so bad. That's not, not bad. See, so it, it costs five extra minutes than driving in the morning, so. <laughs> oh, wow. That's really not bad. Not at all. <laughs> and, and you're also a wrestler, right? Yes. Uh, how'd you get into that? So when I found out I was going to Ida Crown... My parents told me I'd be on the wrestling team. <laughs> I was just, I was like, okay. I really didn't know what I was getting into. My father um, knew knew the coach from a while back, so they they they've been good friends. So, are you good? I'm decent. <laughs> I, I mean, How's the team doing? How's the team doing this year? <laughs> well, right now it's summer, but we're gonna have new freshmen, and hopefully. So it'll be good. All right. Oh, so so it's a mystery still. So basically, <laughs> mystery, but yeah. Okay, right. That's, that's fair. I'm hoping we'll have a good season. All okay. right. So here's us wishing good luck to the Ida Crown wrestling team this season. Yes. Yes. A successful season. Thanks for coming in.
No problem. I'll make sure to tell Coach about this. <laughs> yeah, <Yes>. definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Straw Hat. As always, we are grateful to our producer, Haley Leventhal, for all the work she does for this episode. If you liked listening to this episode and you like listening to The Straw Hat, you should definitely feel free to give us a rating on whatever you listen to podcasts on. Uh, Maybe other people will pick it up if they see that you think we're great. Um, If you have positive feedback, you should definitely tell us in person or send us a note. If you have negative feedback on Tish Above, Um, We don't talk or like extend greetings, so actually you can just keep that negative feedback to yourself. We look forward to sharing upcoming episodes with you of The Straw Hat. Have a great week.